Welcome to this evening's event, and thanks for taking the time to be here. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Jeff Kubiak. I'm a senior fellow here at the Center on the Future of War and a professor of practice in the School of Politics and Global Studies, where I co-direct an online MA in Global Security. This is the first event of the academic year for the Center on the Future of War speaker series. Uh, as many of you know, these events are normally held in person on the Tempe campus, but obviously the uh, current situation has called for this minor modification. The good news is that Center friends from across the country can join us and hear some very interesting people talk about relevant and contemporary security topics. Welcome to everyone. As I mentioned, um, this is the first and what is shaping up to be a very interesting year in speaker, speaker events. While many are still uh, tentative, we do know that Dr. David Cullen, one of the nation's leading counterinsurgency and counterterrorism experts, will join us for an event on August 26th. He'll be discussing his new model of geopolitical uh, conflict, liminal warfare, that he highlights in his latest book, The Dragons and the Snakes. Additionally, as many of you know, the Center on the Future of War in New America um, think tank in DC, the marquee event of the year is the Future Security Forum. And this past spring, it was canceled for uh, obvious reasons again. It has been rescheduled this fall uh, as a multi-day online event, uh, September 21 through September 24, maybe about two hours per day. And this is, again, a, a, a pan, a, a, an event full of really heavy hitting, um, not only big topics, but uh, big brains talking about these big topics. Obviously, Emery Slaughter, the um, CEO of New America and a professor of practice at Arizona State as well, uh, will open it up and we'll, have, we'll hear from the likes of, of General Vodal, the um, former commander of U.S. Central Command, Michelle Flournoy, the former uh, Undersecretary of Defense for Policy, and a host of other very heavy hitters with regards to security policy. So again, that's September 21 through 24. Uh, in about two hour blocks, you'll be getting more notifications on that if you're on the Center of the Future of Wars email list. Um, our event tonight promises to be very interesting. Candace Rondeau will be discussing the implications of her extensive research into the behavior of the Russian government, the agencies associated with the government, and private military contractors, or PMCs. Candace will open with a few comments before we go into a question and answer session. And due to the size of the audience of this event, we'll only be fielding questions through the Q&A message function that you can access by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. I'm gonna give you a fairly extensive introduction to Candace because she has had an amazing career and she's done some really remarkable things and I want to make sure you're all aware of them. First and foremost, in my mind, Candace is a professor of practice in the School of Politics and Global Studies here at Arizona State University where she teaches classes in our online MA in global security on post-conflict governance in the, and in proxy warfare. She's a senior fellow at the Center on the Future of War, the joint initiative between ASU and New America. She's an expert in international security affairs, and she has previously served as a senior program officer at the U.S. Institute of Peace, where she launched the Resolve Network, a global research consortium on conflict and violent extremism, and, as a strategic, and was a strategic advisor to the U.S. Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction. She spent five years living and working in South Asia, where she served as a senior analyst in Afghanistan for the International Crisis Group and as a South Asia bureau chief for the Washington Post in Afghanistan and Pakistan. Her research interests include the dynamics of conflict and sectarian violence, transparency and accountability in governance, political Islam in modern Muslim majority states, Russian and post-Soviet affairs. In addition to the, uh, the Washington Post, her work has been featured in Lawfare, Foreign Policy, Foreign Affairs, the International Herald Tribune, the Boston Globe, the Russian Journal, and the Village Voice. She's a frequent guest analyst on CNN, Al Jazeera, BBC World, and National Public Radio. In her postings in South Asia, she produced award-winning journalism on criminal justice and legal affairs, contributing to the Washington Post Pulitzer Prize-winning coverage of the 2007 Virginia Tech Massacre, her coverage of, of, of Hurricane Katrina, the Terry Shavo case, and the Saint, for the St. Petersburg Times in Florida, and the 9-11 tax in New York for the investigative team at the New York Daily News. An amazing resume for such a young woman, uh, for anyone, quite frankly. Candace, is great to have you. Thanks for joining us. And without anything further from me, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks, Jeff, so much. Um, I love to be called a young woman. <laughs> who, doesn't, who doesn't love to be called young? Um, thanks for having me here. I, um, I really appreciate it. And I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that uh, more people are piling in as we, as we kind of get started. Um, this is a great time to be talking about uh, Russia's role. Obviously, Russia's in the headlines. And it's, it's kind of my, um, my big hobby <laughs> or obsession. And so I'm, I'm really excited to, to share with everybody a little bit about 
the research I've been doing and kind of how it connects to what we're seeing today um, around the world, but also especially in the United States where uh, we have so many different crises converging uh, in terms of the pandemic and the economic challenges now caused by the pand pandemic. And then of course, um, I think some of the challenges that we're gonna face around the elections coming up. Um, so let me dive in here. I'm gonna try and share my screen. Um, first and move into some slides that um, I prepared. And hopefully that will work. So um, <laughs> I tried to come up with a catchy title. Um, I'm a big James Bond, Bond fan, so uh, this seemed appropriate. Um, the research that I've been doing for the last couple of years uh, in large part is um, really the result of a joint effort really across the university. Uh, I want to give a shout out especially to the data mining and machine learning lab um, at the School of Engineering and also uh, the Malikian Center for Russian Studies uh, and, um, uh, and a lot of the other folks who've helped out uh, in, with supporting this, but especially to the students um, who've been so pivotal. Uh, we've had a, a wonderful group of undergraduates uh, and an occasional graduate student uh, from the MAGS program uh, who have pitched in and uh, added a lot more of uh, their um, work and energy to this project. Um, so what is this all about? Well, uh, the origins of this project really started about two years ago, as I said, um, as part of our work on proxy warfare uh, and looking specifically at Russia's proxy warfare strategy uh, around the world uh, and in Syria. And uh, many of you will know uh, the guy on the left, uh, uh, Yevgeny Prigozhin, but back um, in 2016, that wasn't a name that we were very familiar with, uh, at least here in the United States. But a lot of folks in Ukraine uh, and increasingly in Syria, uh, at the time I began this, Rus this research on Russia, uh, did know who Yevgeny Prigozhin is. Uh, and um, my job was really to figure out um, who he was and explain that uh, to the American people, uh, and, and I think anyway. Um, Yevgeny Prigozhin is the same man that you may know as the um, oligarch who comes from St. Petersburg, uh, and runs the Internet Research Agency, which was um, the troll factory that was responsible for interference in the uh, 2016 uh, elections. He also happens to be the financier of a group of uh, paramilitary um, private military security companies. Um, they're known generally as the Wagner Group, but they actually are um, a group of private military companies that service the Russian government. Two years ago, I wrote a report about them, uh, sort of their origin story, uh, and tried to trace them uh, across from Ukraine to, to Syria. And these are known as the little green men. You see them there on the right-hand side. Uh, the impression um, that many people have is, you know, that this is some sort of ghost army. Um, but the reality is that um, it takes a lot to send, you know, several hundred guys um, semi-secretly uh, from, uh, you know, Western Russia into Ukraine or Syria. Uh, and a lot of what we now know about the Wagner Group and Yevgeny Prigozhin um, has come from a lot of investigative reporting by uh, Russian journalists in particular at the Novaya Gazeta, which is the uh, last independent newspaper in Russia, uh, and a couple of other journalists um, based in Europe. And what we've learned, of course, is uh, that these guys act as, as proxies, they're mercenaries, um, they are pay-to-play soldiers, basically. But we don't know a lot about um, how the business model works, and that's kind of what I wanted to dive into. And just as I was wrapping up my research and publishing the first report in November uh, of 2019 uh, for New America, uh, I got this sort of strange tweet, uh, you know, that kind of flew across uh, my Twitter account, and I was like, what the heck is that? And it was this video, um, just a little uh, s snippet of a video uh, of a group of guys standing around beating the heck out of another man who was on the ground uh, laying there, and they were beating him with a sledgehammer. Uh, it was an incredibly graphic video, uh, and it was a video um, that 
uh, others who've been doing research on the Wagner group had seen before, uh, but I had actually never seen it. Um, and uh, within maybe an hour of that crossing my account, it seemed like the video just went viral. Um, and so some of the students uh, that I work with uh, on, uh, this, on this research at the Data Mining Machine Learning Lab and I, we decided we wanted to figure out um, what was behind this video? Where was this coming from? And what we learned uh, really shocked us. Um, we applied some interesting methods um, that I, I want to sort of share with you um, because it's a tricky thing to um, prove a negative. You know, the Kremlin has always said, well, we don't know anything about the Wagner Group. Uh, we're not connected to the Wagner Group. We don't support them. And in fact, um, they're not there. And, and so a lot of the reporting on uh, the Wagner Group and their activities in Ukraine and Syria, uh, including you know, uh, their app apparent involvement in this video, um, was really just a matter of kind of conjecture. And I really wanted to come up with a way to kind of defeat all the conjecture and the conspiracy theories uh, and move away from the anecdotal to a more sort of macro systemic look at, um, at this group of you know, hundreds and hundreds of soldiers that had been deployed across uh, from the Black Sea region into the Middle East. And so um, after doing some training with Bellingcat, which is a collective that does uh, work on um, open source digital uh, investigations, I kind of came up with this idea of trying to find a way to automate the collection process. Um, I wanted to see if we could model um, or forecast who would be in this kind of group uh, and who would be outside of this kind of group. And um, after some time, I learned, of course, that, um, you know, like a lot of people around the world, uh, Russian soldiers also like to use social media. Um, yeah, they use Facebook. Yes, yeah, they use Twitter. But the most popular platform for a lot of Russians, uh, not just soldiers, is Vkontakte, which is sort of a, a Facebook knockoff. Uh, it happens to be one of the largest social media platforms in the world, and it has about 480 million users. But interestingly, of course, a lot of English speakers don't know much about it because it's mostly populated by Russian speakers. Um, it's also where uh, a lot of Wagner um, paramilitary soldiers kind of live. Um, they spend a lot of time online uh, talking to each other, teasing each other, um, but they also post a lot of information about what they do and how they do it. Um, and in the process of doing this research, I, I came across a number of what are called community groups on uh, the contact you, which are basic, basically sort of social circles, um, you know, fanboy groups. Um, normally they might follow a rock star um, or a particular, you know, um, a particular uh, horror film uh, fanboy base. Um, but these guys have their own soldier of fortune lifestyle community groups on the contact you. And along the way, um, we came across one um, that's called the Wagner Military Review that when we started, um, had a little bit over 6,000 users. Um, so that was, you know, um, way back in uh, November of uh, 2019. Um, you know, we, we saw a snapshot and we saw that it had about 6,000 plus users. By the time we were done with our research, that group, that membership in that group had grown to 16,000 members. And today it's probably about uh, 19 or 20,000 members. That's just one community group um, based uh, on, you know, this sort of social media, uh, soldier of fortune lifestyle um, sort of network complex. But there were dozens of others that were linked to that particular community group um, that had similar themes. And we started to notice that many of them, you know, um, closed with rifles and tanks, and they had certain signs and symbols that were very common. And so I started to wonder, is there a way we could find a way to sort of systematically sift through all this data, all these signs and symbols, uh, and start to understand not only who these guys are and what they like, but what's the structure of the organization if they actually are members of the Wagner Group um, or part of the Russian PMC um, industry. And it turned out actually, it's, it's not so easy to sift through and figure out who's who, but the, the, the video that um, became viral uh, showing um, 
a man being beaten to the ground someplace, nobody knew where, um, turned out to be quite instructive for us. We examined that video and, and we examined everybody who, who posted that video uh, uh, and talked about that video. And, and we started to understand um, some, some of the features of how the features of the video, um, the location, the, um, the background, some of the objects that were used, some of the um, details on the uniforms uh, that the men in the video were wearing, um, ex could explain to us at least the location. And what we learned, of course, was that it was um, based in Syria, um, and that the four men pictured in the video um, actually probably worked for Russian PMC. We didn't know whether it was the Wagner group. We didn't know for sure um, who they were and who they were connected to. But like any network problem, it kind of demanded a networked response. And so we started to look at um, the friendship networks of people who shared this video or shared information about this video. And very quickly, um, we identified a group of people who actually seemed to have been uh, in the same location roughly around the same time. Um, and if you see here this sort of um, network um, map here that we have, we traced a group of soldiers, uh, Russian soldiers, who had served in Donbass in Ukraine all the way to this little point uh, in, in the middle of Syria near uh, a, a gas reserve that um, Russian companies had uh, been working with the Syrian government to exploit uh, and also to defend against ISIS. And it was actually in um, 2017, the summer of 2017, that this video was shot. Um, it, it, over time, more details emerged and we understood um, the kind of connections uh, between the men in the picture, uh, in the video, and also their wider network and their worldview. Uh, and that, for me, was a, a kind of light bulb moment. It's when I finally understood how Russia does what it does, how it exports authoritarianism. Um, what we learned was that there were strong um, pre-existing social ties from uh, the military service between the men pictured in the video, as well as um, the men who sort of sat outside in their social circle uh, on that network map. And we also learned that a lot of them were special forces soldiers, Spetsnaz uh, soldiers who came from, primarily from the Russian uh, airborne forces, but uh, there was a mix. Uh, some were snipers, some were artillery specialists. Um, all of them you know, put this information online uh, remarkably. Um, we also learned that there was a significant overlap between Russian mercenaries and transnational white supremacists um, uh, around the world. And specifically, uh, we discovered that the men pictured in the video belong to a paramilitary group based out of St. Petersburg known as Rusich. Uh, that group um, was responsible for a number of war crimes in, in Donbass um, and that have come before the International Criminal Court. Um, at the same time, uh, they also appear in a lot of propaganda videos, and, um, and their leader, uh, Alexei Michalkov, um, still lives in St. Petersburg openly, freely, um, and he associates and affiliates with a lot of other um, Russian uh, ultranationalist groups with a white supremacist bent. One of them happens to be the Russian imperial movement, and um, just as we were wrapping up uh, our, our reporting on this, um, this particular case, uh, which was in al Shir, Syria. Um, it just so happened that the United States State Department issued uh, a broad press release announcing that they planned um, to designate the Russian imperial movement as a state-sponsored uh, terrorist organization, essentially. And um, this was the first time uh, in, in recent memory, and maybe ever, uh, that the State Department and the U.S. government had taken a step to designate a transnational white nationalist group. It was a really big deal. Um, and since then, um, since the publication of the report and since the designation uh, of the Russian imperial movement, we've been working to try and understand um, what these guys are about and what this movement is about. And um, we've begun that work uh, and had sort of a few um, big takeaways. They're all kind of part of a, a movement uh, that has been around for quite some time, uh, you know, really kind of as, as far back as certainly uh, the 1920s, 
um, you know, this idea of um, accelerating a race war um, sort of animates this long line uh, of white supremacist um, groupings. But what's different about today's um, accelerationist groups like the Russian Imperial Movement, um, like the traditional, Traditionalist Workers Party in the base, uh, the Boogaloo Movement, is they have a, an extra special tool, uh, which is basically you know, Facebook, uh, Twitter, and, uh, and other social media accounts. And that is what um, has changed the nature of this movement from something that just happens um, online to something that now happens offline in the real world uh, in many more places uh, than where it originally began uh, in Russia primarily. Um, some of the, the big sort of tenets of the accelerationist movement uh, kind of focus on the idea of a leaderless revolution. And in a way, um, it kind of draws a lot uh, of its inspiration from what happened during the Arab Spring uh, and the sort of spontaneous civic uprisings. Um, but there's a little twist in there, which is that it also focuses, the movement focuses a lot on the idea of race traitors. Uh, and, and many of you will remember of course, uh, the incident in Charlottesville uh, and Matthew Heimbach, who's pictured down here below on the left-hand side uh, with the guy with the uh, Nazi helmet here. Uh, as he's, uh, of course, the member of the Traditionalist Workers Party and um, was president in Charlottesville. Uh, he has become one of the most notorious um, white supremacists in the United States and um, has deep links uh, and made many attempts um, to kind of draw this um, boundaryless movement, uh, you know, from Russia uh, across Europe into the United States. And so there's a movement um, back and forth between these members. Uh, more recently in December uh, of last year, um, the FBI arrested a young man named Ronaldo Navarro, uh, who happens to be the leader of uh, the base and, or at least, he, he claims that he wasn't, but of course he was. Uh, and he spent a lot of time in St. Petersburg training with the Russian Imperial Movement. Um, and so there you have yet again, these crossover links. Um, conspiracy theories, disinformation, um, catalyzing social upheaval, um, and then reviving white supremacy are all part of a piece. Um, and, and these movements now are so large um, and so prevalent in, in parts of Europe um, and now increasingly in North America, that um, the FBI, uh, the State Department, uh, and, and other branches of the U.S. government have begun to sort of combine forces um, to assess um, whether this is the kind of threat that is going to verge on something like we saw with the, the burgeoning of Al-Qaeda uh, some now, you know, 30 years ago. Uh, it's too soon to say, but I think there are some reasons to believe uh, we're starting to see some signs, of course, of the paramilitary presence um, at, at protests uh, around the country that certainly would suggest uh, that there is a kind of convergence uh, between these traditions uh, and this growing accelerationist movement from Russia. So that leaves us with some interesting insights, I think. Um, you know, if you had asked uh, me four or five years ago uh, before the 2016 presidential elections, uh, what's Russia up to? I don't think I could have actually really answered very accurately. I think a lot of people were in the same boat. I think that was true of the U.S. government. Um, but I think what we've learned over the last four years, uh, five years, is that Russia's war on democracy is really a war on reality. It's, um, it's a mind-bending com combination of um, uh, undermining institutions as well as bending the truth. Uh, and promoting disinformation, but also most importantly, uh, the convergence comes again with um, this sort of dedicated exacerbation of existing um, social divides. And we saw that uh, in Ukraine, uh, we've seen it in Syria, and now we're starting to see it in the United States and other parts of the world, uh, including Africa, uh, where you know we have a war ongoing in Libya uh, and Sudan that, where Russia is quite active. Uh, and the Wagner Group was, was quite active. So what does all this add up to? Well, this is the kind of crisis convergence uh, that a lot of people have been talking about for a long time. The pandemic is putting pressure on the economy. Um, it's raising sort of a degree of social unrest. The looming uh, electoral deadline uh, has people very worried. Uh, the clashes between the federal governments, uh, federal authorities, um, and, and local um, residents in places like Portland, Chicago, 
Um, this is exactly the kind of recipe for crisis convergence um, that many people have feared and certainly is something that Russia will be taking advantage of uh, in terms of spreading um, disinformation, but also um, stoking this acceleration, this movement, uh, and trying to get it out there active on the street. And I think we should be looking out for that. So that's kind of my brief take uh, on, the, on the research. I'll um, give it over to, to Jeff. Great, thanks. Uh, Candace, that was fantastic. At least, you know, you actually, um, in your discussion, preempted many of my, any questions that I had. I have, I do have a couple, uh, just a couple that I want you to expand upon. Um, kind of, where do you, where else have you tracked actual activity from Russian directed, if you will, or Russian motivated groups and, or uh, uh, the Wagner group in particular, where else have you tracked their activity that's actually produced results in terms of increasing tensions, increasing um, you know, social conflict, like, like you've seen in the United States, because Americans are typically very, you know, this is, we're, we're, we're the world. Where else in the world is this going on? And how do we, and do you see evidence of these groups, or, you know, inciting that sort of um, tensions elsewhere? Great question. I mean, actually, we saw this week, I, I don't know if um, you saw it, Jeff, but in the news just yesterday, uh, there was some report reporting by the Moscow Times and a couple other uh, publications had coverage of uh, uh, Belarus where uh, the Lukashenko government arrested some, I think it was like 33 or 38 um, Russian private military uh, contractors who were staying in a hotel in Minsk. Uh, apparently, you know, the frame that the Lukashenko government um, kind of tried to put out there was that they didn't know anything about their presence. And in fact, that there were 200 more, um, you know, covert agents, little green men who had infiltrated into Belarus. Uh, it just so happens that um, this event is taking place only days before um, a national election for the presidency uh, in which Lukashenko is largely expected to, to win, but there has been a lot of discontent on the streets already. Um, you know, from uh, a broad swath of Belarusians who are uh, eager to join Europe, very similar to Ukraine, uh, tired of being under the heel of Russia, um, again, very similar to Ukraine. And Lukashenko um, is kind of taking a piece from the Yanukovych playbook, um, maybe trying to even get ahead of that in some ways. <laughs> so, I mean, that's just one example where I think, you know, we'll see how that story evolves. Um, but Belarus, um, you know, people have long feared that Russia would try and um, repeat basically some of the things it did in, in Ukraine uh, in Belarus and ultimately annex the country. Um, other places where we've seen a combination uh, of both the Internet Research Agency and Wagner Group paramilitaries being deployed, um, the, obviously the most prominent instance here is Libya. And there's been a lot of reporting on that. We've been sort of uh, tracking their presence. Um, and of course, in the last two or three weeks, the Pentagon has issued a number of, um, un, you know, uh, statements about their concerns about Russia's engagement in the region, in large part because of uh, the Wagner Group presence there. So, um, it, you know, presence is growing in some parts of the world. Um, the places where I think, you know, strategically speaking, Russia is most interested um, are, you know, in places where uh, it needs to sort of transport goods. So you'll see a lot of focus in the littoral areas of the Mediterranean, uh, the Red Sea. So we also see them in Sudan, for instance. Uh, last year during the uprising uh, against the Omar Bashir's government um, that led to the popular unrest and then the transition, um, you know, Wagner Group was there on the ground. And it just so happened that, you know, months before that, the Internet Research Agency had launched its own kind of campaign uh, playing on some of the localized um, divisions between uh, local Sudanese um, and the same way that they did in, in, in Libya just a few years ago. So uh, it's a common tactic uh, and we're certainly starting to see them obviously here in the United States. Mm -hmm. Not Wagner Group necessarily, um, but sort of a, uh, sort of a co-optation of uh, militia movements here by Russian ideology. That's, you know, you made the comment earlier that this is something that the, the Soviets before them and the, and the Russians have been doing for a century, for all intents and purposes. How is it, and then you mentioned social media being kind of the, 
you know, the, the difference between us recognizing it, 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 it taking us several years to recognize it, but now kind of coming to recognize the, the danger it poses to democracy. Well, how does that work exactly? Give me some, give me some, why is social media such a critical component of elevating this to an actual security threat? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that we often forget is, you know, the history of humankind has always had um, debates about what the truth is, right? Debates about um, the veracity of evidence. And, um, you know, back in the medieval times, before, uh, you know, there was a printing press and sort of mass production of books, um, those debates were mostly, you know, through oral um, you know, uh, communication, uh -huh. but when the printing press, uh, you know, uh, was online, um, there was a massive shift in the way people viewed the truth. And, um, and that was a revolutionary moment. So, I mean, in, in human history, we've always had these moments where technology um, has kind of um, evolved to the point where it creates an inflection point in how um, we all communicate the truth to each other um, and our consensus around what the nature of evidence is. And we saw that with the introduction of radio. Uh, we saw that with the introduction of television. And now, of course, with social media, we're seeing the same thing. Russia uh, has a very rich tradition of studying um, the psychology of communications uh, and in particular, um, psychological warfare. And, um, you know, they're not a unique in the sense that um, they're the first to do it, but they do have whole institutes dedicated um, to this tradition. And this playbook of, you know, exacerbating existing ethnic tensions goes all the way back to the 1917 revolution. Um, they did it first in Europe, of course, when they were trying to expand the Soviet space. But ultimately during the Cold War, uh, you know, when they were uh, you know, in competition with the United States for influence, right? Um, the first thing that um, the Russians went to was the race playbook uh, when trying to cultivate sympathies uh, inside the United States. And you know, we now know, we, we remember, of course, the McCarthy era um, and the kind of paranoia and conspiracy theories and, um, and in fact, the, the war of propaganda uh, that really began then and started to kind of unravel uh, our institutions and our faith in each other and our understanding of evidence uh, at that time. Interesting. Great. I, we've got, I don't know, 25 minutes or so left in this, and I really want to, to uh, interact with some of the audience questions. If you've got questions, it's click the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen there. Uh, we've already got a couple in the queue, and there's a couple of really good questions to start out with. And then one asks about how the um, how does rapidly increasing authoritarian role in Turkey fit into this picture? And is there a role there for the Russians? Is my question, right? Uh, especially if it seems uh, to go um, away separate from NATO and from Russia? Really good question. It, right. So, you know, what's really interesting about this moment is that we have, you know, kind of an interesting stretch of, of territory spanning from the Black Sea, right, um, to include, you know, the western edge of Russia, uh, even Belarus, and we've got, you know, Turkey just across the sea. Um, again, in competition with each other. Uh, Erdogan, as we all know, has been on a kind of um, authoritarian trajectory for well over a decade now. And, um, you know, I think one of the things that we maybe have failed to fully appreciate is that the Arab Spring um, was a devastating shock to every government around the world that um, felt that it was not uh, economically and socially stable. And some governments handled it, you know, in different ways, but without a doubt, um, that kind of social unrest we saw, we saw Egypt, we saw Tunisia, we saw uh, Bahrain. I mean, the entire Middle East um, was turned over on its head uh, and, and Turkey is there. Um, so the, the relationship is, is really um, one of kind of a parallel knee-jerk response, uh, a fear of being uh, displaced. Um, but the reality about, of, of authoritarianism is uh, it, it takes two things to make it go. It takes state capture by elites and um, of, of goods, assets, services, 
uh, and it takes very weak institutions, uh, very weak checks and balances um, on the overall political system. But always a fundamental is a lack of press freedom um, and, uh, and, of course, suppression of speech. And we've been seeing Erdogan uh, move in this direction for quite some time. I think we now see, you know, where three or four years ago, there was less competition between uh, Russia and Turkey, and in fact, even a sort of sense of cooperation, right? Um, that the challenges over uh, the wrestling over control of uh, Mediterranean passageways, uh, as well as um, the territory, uh, you know, that lies between uh, Turkey and, and, and Russia on the littoral zone. Um, a, that's an old <laughs> competition. It goes back a couple hundred years. But B, it's been reignited uh, in large part by all the social unrest um, uh, from stemming from the Arab Spring. Uh, and I, I don't actually think, I think ultimately, um, the real question that we probably should be asking is, um, how long will Turkey be an active member of NATO? Right. I, and I think that there are some real reasons to be concerned um, that um, the sort of inward turning both of Europe um, as well as the impact of Brexit on the, uh, on the alliance could uh, ultimately turn Turkey into its own isolationist pole uh, quite apart from Russia. Mm -hmm. uh, so that would put yet another competitor on the chessboard. All right. Yeah, the complexity of the whole thing is is really pretty pretty intense, and actually the dynamics that are occurring aren't necessarily at the direction of Russia, right? They're not. They they think they can achieve an agenda this way, but this not, they're not directing. They're not the puppet masters, but they are injecting and trying to move a very complex system in a very advantageous direction. They don't control it, though. I think that's kind of part and parcel to that piece as well. One of the questions I got from one of the, the um, actually a former student researcher for the Center on the Future of War, MJ, um, is the U.S. Far behind in the cyber online disinformation as it seems, because it, um, it does strike us as kind of a surprise. And we're surprised in 2016 to kind of get a sense for this. Four years later, we're still now trying to figure out what's going on. And, and as we're trying to figure out what's going on, it's all evolving. Why would this be? And, uh, and why did we not see it coming? Well, look, I mean, on, on the cyber side, you know, there's two points, there are two, two parts that we're talking about, right? One is the kind of um, the hackety hack. Um, sort of device capture, system capture that, um, you know, the folks at the NSA really focus on. And then there's the information space. And Russia actually doesn't see them as separate. Uh, and, and actually China doesn't see them as separate. Our challenge uh, in the United States has been, there has been this kind of bifurcated approach um, right. to cyber and information. And institutionally, um, we also have some other challenges in so much as monitoring speech or expression, uh, even if it's on, you know, a cyber platform, right, like uh, Facebook or um, Twitter, still is a tricky thing under our constitution, which of course guarantees free expression. In fact, earlier this week, we saw some debates about that, obviously yesterday with the um, uh, hearing in, in Congress right. with, you know, Mark Zuckerberg and friends. So um, one reason is just kind of some of the foundational principles uh, here that, you know, that we always, always wrestle with about um, expression and then containment and monitoring of speech, right? But another big reason is really, um, I have to say, I think, you know, the State Department, um, the Pentagon, the National Security Enterprise, right, the entire kind of agency, interagency process has been for the last 20, almost 30 years now, um, obsessed with Al Qaeda, obsessed with ISIS, obsessed with uh, primarily Islamist extremist um, groups uh, online and offline. And the counterterrorism framing, um, I think kind of unfortunately made for a very lopsided response uh, to the challenge posed by, by Russia in particular. So that's another uh, big reason, but also we don't have specialists. Um, and MJ will know this <laughs> as well as anybody else. Um, you know, one of the jobs that we have, I think, at, at Arizona State um, and in other universities is to really build this pipeline of specialists who speak two languages and, and also understand uh, emerging security threats and really how to be a dynamic player uh, and respond uh, to those threats. That's, that's awesome. Yeah. 
and you know, and kind of along those, we talked about the bifurcation issue and in, in American society, strategic culture is kind of full of those sorts of things. One of them is that we routinely return to the military to solve national security problems. If it's a national security issue, it belongs in the five-sided, well, the five-sided puzzle panels. Um, for those in the military recognize it as the Pentagon. Uh, one of our students, one of our MAG students, asked a really good question. He's a, I know he's an Army officer, and, and I also know that a Professor Aris, uh, one of our MAG's professors of practice, Ajit Mahan, recently spoke at the uh, U.S. Army's Mad Scientist program, too, discussing disinformation and, and strategy with regards to the disinformation campaigns and, and narrative conflicts. And this student wants to know, you know, what role does the military play? in combating this use of information warfare and native narrative-based warfare. Is there a role or how, how should how should the military be approaching this issue? Well, I mean, listen, I, I have my own bias in terms of like how I, how I view um, their involvement. On the one hand, I think the military, as often happens in the United States, is driving forward the conversation about what the doctrine should be, right? Mm -hmm. And driving forward the conversation about how do you resource a response? How do you um, administer and cr create a bureaucracy that combines kind of a look at, you know, cyber threats and then combines um, the information uh, and influence campaigns? I think the military can play somewhat of a role, but I, I think that there are lots of limits for, um, in particular, for uh, the Pentagon. One of the biggest limits is simply uh, being able to operate in an open source environment and mm -hmm. exchange information freely. Uh, this is, I mean, what we've learned from the research that we've done is you have to be absolutely fluid um, in your approach to the digital um, dynamics and the, uh, and the world that's out there. The world of data that's out there is not something that is um, well structured, you know? Right. Uh, it's not uh, just all some in, in these little canisters that you can go and say like, oh, look there, there are some, you know, there are some Al Qaeda guys, and then there are some, you know, uh, Russian mercenaries over here. Um, and so, really, this is going to be kind of um, we're going to need a broad approach that engages the private sector. But I have to say, I think the research community is going to be absolutely critical um, because it's there where the experimentation that you know like the kind we've done, mm -hmm. um, you know, the folks at Stanford uh, Internet Observatory are beginning to do this, right? Um, Oxford Internet uh, Observatory. This is now, if you want to get ahead of the game uh, as a journalist, as an investigator, uh, as an intel operator, you really have to have high level skills in social computational, uh, social science, right? That's the only way um, to really get ahead of the game. And unfortunately, um, so far, the Pentagon hasn't quite figured out how to make that into, um, you know, a series of ranks that you attain um, and has some sort of promotional value, right? Yeah, and, and and in a lot of ways, it's actually true of education in general. But that's I think that's that's definitely true with regards to this specific adaptation and in, in skill sets because it's it's it is different and it's not not in the norm. And so the the force is not filled with people like that. That that does bring up. Um, an idea, though, I think maybe we've got a course in the build in the in the making on uh, on the use of OSI, how to, how, to, how to use open source information, how to how to you know how to manipulate not manipulate but work with capture and work with open source information. We've got the resources here in, in the university. I think we should probably build the course for that for our MA. What do you say? We good? I'm down with that. All Anytime. Right. All right. So one of the, this is so the so what and this is a, a good question from a practitioner, right? This is. So it's a so what? So what do we do? And one of the questions, one of the one of the preferred strategies, if you will, is to protect democracy. We need to deter this sort of behavior by outsiders who would otherwise want to disrupt U.S. institutions and U.S. society. What sort of is there a mechanism out there to deter Russian behavior in this situation or in this in this kind of activity? Certainly, with regards to our elections. Well, look, there, there are two sides of deterrence, but the first, the first part of deterrence is to reduce the number of targets, right? Okay. And um, what's really key here is to understand that the target is the American people. It's not, um, you know, it's not just devices that we're talking about here. Right. And I think there's a, there's a real temptation to kind of get distracted by the platforms and the tech, but the reality is, um, you know, if we can get some uh, 
I think, progress on the challenges that we have with inequality in this country uh, and, and really listen to some of the things that are, that are being asked of us in terms of um, rebalancing our idea of justice. Um, I think we're gonna find that um, a lot of this racial division, uh, the heat starts to dissipate. Um, the more we can dissipate that heat, mm -hmm. uh, the less, uh, you know, anybody, China, Russia, you name it, um, there just won't be an attack surface, basically, right? right. I mean, that's how you right. think of it. Yep. Um, we, are the, we are the attack surface, and our institutions are the attack surface. Um, and we, you know, we're not going to be able to battle um, Yevgeny Prigozhin in court. You know, uh, the federal government uh, tried to indict him. And, uh, you know, in, in connection with the Russian interference. Right. And lo and behold, uh, every time that there was a, a request for discovery, uh, it got leaked into the public, right? So our institutions actually don't work for us uh, in the ways we would like them to. Um, we're going to have to be a lot cleverer, and we're going to have to really think about how we can change the iniquities that make us vulnerable. Um, that's one piece of it. But I, I would say I'm certain, you know, there's a, uh, a, you know, there's another way we can be more aggressive. And I would say, to be honest with you, the biggest investment the United States can make right now um, is in encouraging um, anti-corruption um, organizations, human rights defenders, um, you know, freewheeling investigators, uh, and, and journalists who really have great skill sets and who can show um, how um, elites and oligarchs in their own countries are abusing power um, and, um, and using the resources uh, offered to them oftentimes by Russia uh, and China, frankly, right. um, you know, in order to grow their own uh, local power. That's really key. So those two things, reduce the attack surface um, and really build an army of unconventional investigators out there um, who can challenge um, um, oligarchy and who can challenge authoritarianism in their own localities. Let me shift gears just a little bit. There's a good question here that I think probably um, you could shed some light on for us because there are a lot of folks who just never under, who never knew what QAnon was before recent events, right? So now there are some pretty high profile individuals swearing allegiance to the organization, it seems to have surfaced as a fairly significant player in, in, in when in previously it was unknown and had been a marginal player on, the, on, a, on at, at his highlight. So have you found any links from this group to Russia or Russian activity? And, or does this group just strictly use similar activity or uh, tactics? And how big is this threat to America's institutions and social cohesion? Very good question. Um, look, I mean, in terms of the origin story of, of QAnon, I don't think anybody's really quite figured that out yet. I, I certainly haven't spent a lot of time on that. Uh, what, what you can see in the evidence, though, right, in the data, uh, and, you know, again, others have been doing a lot of work to kind of collect on, um, you know, COVID conspiracies, QAnon conspiracy, conspiracies. Mm -hmm. Whenever you see a conspiracy cropping up and getting amplified, um, you better believe that Russia is there amplifying it. Um, that's happening. And, but how that's happening um, is actually a little bit more complex. I mean, I know that there's this, um, you know, the, the current narrative is the GRU, which is of course the, the main intelligence directorate, um, which is the sort of military intelligence wing of, of Russia, um, is the big boogeyman here. But the, the reality is there are, you know, about a half dozen intelligence services that work um, in, for Russia. And one in particular is often ignored, which is the FSB, which is the old KGB, basically. Um, I did a piece on this for the World Politics Review, where I write a column every week. Uh, and, you know, the reality is the FSB has just as many uh, hackers for hire uh, that it, it contracts out to amplify messages um, by conspiracy um, figures like QAnon, right? So, um, and frankly, you know, it, it's, a, it's an opportunity moment here, you know, that no opportunity is lost for authoritarian governments. Um, that goes for China, that goes for Russia, that goes for Iran and North Korea. Let's expand on that now because you, the, the title of this talk was, had to do with convergence. And you mentioned it briefly, the role that the COVID pandemic is playing. Um, can you illuminate more for the, for the crowd, um, kind of where you see, the role of, of, a, of a global pandemic 
uh, shaping the effectiveness or, or, or you know, the, the um, outcomes that are being achieved by these sorts of efforts by the Russians. Well, this is this is the really um, challenging situation. <laughs> I mean, um, nobody could have anticipated uh, this, but but here are some of the things that I think um, make this the convergence of the pandemic and you know the upcoming elections so incredibly uh, challenging from a, a global stability point of view. And that is. We are all captive to our screens, the whole world, right? I mean, most of our reality, our, most of our day today, right, um, you know, is spent online. Yeah. And, you know, there may be places in the world, you know, patches, <laughs> exactly. Mm -hmm. um, there are people who are not connected, but they're probably connected by their mobile phone. Um, and the reality is we are hostages to um, this kind of simulated world. And because our social interactions are cut off outside, um, because of the lockdown, because of the social distancing, we have less and less ability to go out there and um, just ground truth our own reality. So now, you know, I talked about the idea that, you know, we have this sort of war on reality. Um, now everything that we experience in our day to day um, is up for debate, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and we're kind of glued to the screen all the time. So in some ways, it's quite dangerous. And I think certainly COVID um, has also presented, obviously, yet another target of opportunity, just in terms of spreading misinformation uh, and fear. And we've seen obviously the polarization around masks, um, you know, sort of rumor mongering about who did what when. Um, it's it's an extremely dangerous time. Yeah, in, besides elevating the fear and social tensions that actually create again kind of a tinderbox, if you will, for you know for these sorts of things to explode. Which I mean, it's not a coincidence, right? It's not a coincidence that the um, civil rights movement you know became something of, of a of a big movement and created uh, a very term, tumultuous you know, late sixties nineteen sixties. At the same time, there was a Vietnam War going on. There's that sort of fear and tension that goes on, and they kind of work hand in hand. I want to ask one more question off to this off the question and answer board, and then I'm going to give you a chance to wrap up, and we'll be done. How does that sound? Um, here's a, and so I'm going to give you the sixty-four million dollar question right here because this is really what everyone in the audience, I suspect, really wants to know. And this is you mentioned a little bit about the history of truth in mankind. Do you think it's possible to regain a more common consensus of truth? In the, era of, in the era of social media, and more generally, can democracy survive this decentralized understanding of truth? Go. <laughs> <laughs> in two seconds or less. Yeah, right, um, you, got, you got three minutes, what the heck? <laughs> Look, yes, yes, I believe it's possible. And here's why, okay, because history has shown it's possible. Um, before the mass printing of books, um, there was a lot of ignorance out there and, and um, conspiracies were rife, right? Uh, in ways that are just, you know, we, we can't even imagine that world now. Um, there are three things that really change um, the balance in, time, in moments like this where um, a technology has come in and completely upended our idea of reality, warped our idea of reality, warped our idea of evidence and, and truth. Um, the first thing is uh, more access to that technology will begin to change the dynamic, okay? And we're already actually beginning to see that, right? Um, we, in, seven years ago, right, there was no discussion of digital liter literacy. There was no discussion of the need to have news literacy, right? There was, there was none of this was being discussed. And now, um, you know, big name foundations are investing in this, certainly in the United States, definitely in Europe, uh, and increasingly, I think, around the world. I, I don't know if that's gonna be enough, but I think a big piece of it, again, comes back to um, educating the world population mm -hmm. uh, on, you know, what actually is this tool, right? Um, not being just sort of a passive consumer, 
but actually also learning to use the tool in ways that are um, constructive. So that's part one is just kind of building the corporate knowledge around uh, the issues that come with the technology. But part two, uh, and we're, again, we're starting to see this too, is um, you know, building some accountability for the management of the technology. Um, again, you think back to radio, you think back to the early days of TV, right. um, the idea of a public broadcasting bandwidth, nobody was talking about that. Um, reserving um, a space in the airwaves for the public um, where uh, that was sort of a, a guaranteed um, space where it would be neutral, value neutral, hopefully. Again, that wasn't being discussed. Right. And, um, you know, regulation, um, even the uh, Federal Telecommunications um, Commission, right, the FTC, that didn't exist. Um, it may be that sort of we're going to have a combination of legislative regulatory steps that are going to get us to the point where um, tech companies that are in this space are going to have to be more responsive and more accountable for what they do and how they do it, mm -hmm. um, because this is a public utility at the end of the day. Last, I would just say, um, I think, you know, on a global scale, we're probably going to have to create some new kinds of multilateral institutions or at least protocols around um, uh, and norms, you know, uh, right. around um, the use of information technology. Uh, and we're getting there slowly but surely, but I think we're probably a good decade out from finding a place where we have equilibrium. All right, excellent. All right, fantastic. Great, great answers to tough questions. Those are something, I mean, you handled those remarkably well. I mean, super, super answers. I appreciate the time and um, parting shots. I mean, any, any kind of parting thoughts you wanna, you wanna send the audience away with? Um, yeah, I think, you know, one thing I would just say is uh, I know that, uh, you know, we're starting to see in like op-ed pages, um, a lot of debates about what's going to happen with the elections. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think one thing I want to just kind of point out here is what's going to happen with the elections really depends on two things. It depends on you, the voters, um, and you, the citizens, right? Um, you can't complain if you don't vote. So vote, one. Um, and I don't care who you vote for, but do vote. Uh, two, be a good citizen. Uh, this is a time when we really need to be compassionate with each other, patient with each other, uh, and also understanding that, in fact, um, there's going to be a lot of turmoil in the coming days. And if, so if you're out there and you're thinking, you know, I, I want to show my solidarity, uh, you know, you're protesting, um, maybe it's going to be Black Lives Matter. Maybe it's going to be um, some, something around the elections. We don't really know. Um, I just would ask you to really think about the history and the traditions um, and uh, remember John Lewis. Um, you know, get into good trouble um, and keep it peaceful. Outstanding. Great. Thank you so much, Candace. And, and on behalf of the, you know, we had 35, 36 attendees in the, in the audience. It was a fantastic showing. I appreciate everyone taking the time this evening to come out and, uh, and, and participate. Some very good questions. Sorry, we didn't get to all of them. Uh, I apologize for that, but we're running out of time. Come back again. We'll have some more of these events. I appreciate again also you uh, bearing with us and being patient with the uh, mess up with the Zoom link. This is our first real iteration of a sizable um, a sizable webinar. So I appreciate your tolerant, your patience with us. Uh, and please do come back. We'll have many more coming in the future. And we hope to see you uh, engaging with the Center on the Future of War, ASU, and our MA in Global Security. All right, that's all I've got. Candice, again, thank you. And we'll see you next time.